Hi, my name is Douglas Vogt from the Dial Foundation. And this is uh, part three of series 10 on the Exodus and the expeditions that I had uh, led uh, back in 97 and 99 and 2002. So uh, there's over 95 slides in this one, so <laughs> I'm not gonna spend much time uh, uh, wasting your time talking too much. <laughs> anyway, this is gonna cover what happened after the crossing of the Bay of Suez? The previous one ended at that point. Uh, where did Moses go after the crossing? The route up until the Battle of Amalek, which you're going to see where the battlefield was. And the altars uh, made at Mount Sinai. You can see all the altars, every single one that was mentioned by Moses in Exodus and in Leviticus and Numbers. Uh, <clears throat> this is the book I'll be teaching from, Volume 3. It's about 250 pages. It has a lot more in it than what I can do here, but you have some new photographs in this that I didn't have in the book. And you should also probably look at parts two and three in series nine on Joseph, why this whole thing happened and where he put the gold and stuff like that. Um, I'll be covering some of the stuff in page, uh, chapters five, six, and seven of my earlier book, this is, goes back uh, 13 years, but I uh, describe how the ark worked and some of the other things worked, including the rod. Uh, the code systems you have to know, you could watch the videos, part one and two, to know what the, the codes are. That's how I figured this stuff out. Um, and then finally, uh, volume one tells you about why this Mount Sinai was the place, the same place that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and I'll show the altar here again. This is the, uh, roughly the route. Either they, they cross from here to, to someplace along here, but I think here. And uh, uh, it, the distance is 6.85 miles. It converts to 36,204 feet, or 12,068 yards. That number again shows up. <clears throat> the Hebrews arrived on the east side of the Bay of Suez on October 7th. It took them a whole day to do this thing, maybe in a day and a half. And I think when they arrived, they just crapped out and camped there. Um, Moses tells us that they arrived at the base of Mount Sinai the selfsame day they left Goshen. Now, I calculated they left Goshen either the day after or two days after the full moon, because they didn't know how long it took Aaron and Moses to get from Tanis back to Goshen, which is 18 miles. Also, they had to get ready and stuff like that. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's about 60 days from when they left to when they arrived at the base of the hill. So most historians or uh, biblical um, scholars they don't take that into effect when they wind up saying that Mount Sinai is the biggest mountain there and the, the, at the southern base of the uh, uh, Sinai Peninsula or the one in Saudi Arabia, which is totally out of, out of the range. They, they could never make it there in 60 days. Historical relativism. This thing started in the 19th century by anthropologists and probably applied to anything other than the Jewish religion, but uh, some did apply it, and the Reformed Jewish movement in the latter part of the 19th century did apply it, thinking that there was no Moses, they couldn't find Mount Sinai, therefore the Mount Sinai didn't exist, the Exodus didn't exist. You got the picture. And, of course, Jeremiah was the one who finished off uh, Deuteronomy. They were all wrong, of course, which I showed some of this in some of the earlier videos. Anyway, this, is, this video will end and kill once and for all historical relativism as applies towards the Torah. So, they arrive at the other side. I figure two days, a day to cross, and, or a day and a half to cross, and then finally a day to rest. Then the east side to Elam. Elam is where there was, uh, where they stayed a number of days. This is the side trip Moses did to go to Belzephone to clean out whatever gold was in that cave. Oh, well, let me also show. I tried to estimate roughly how many miles per day they were covering. Remember, they got 
I don't think they had 600,000 people. There's no way. Uh, if it was 10,000, I'd be surprised. And I try to calculate how many miles it is to get to these locations and how many days it took to get to, the, to these places. Anyway, this is an old British survey map. It goes back to 1937 to 39. And on it, <laughs> they had this thing called Standing Stone. I said, what the hell is that? Who put a, st a stone or a monument on this spit of land? It's sand. You'll see it in a sec. Also, these dotted lines here are camel tracks. They actually listed the camel tracks and also the wells. Uh, the, the darker lines are obviously roads. So, oh, and by the way, this is the longitude and latitude of where I found this, what I'm about to show you. So you want to go there, you can go there and see it for yourself. Uh, this is the highest point on that spit of land. And I found Standing Stone roughly about a little bit down the hill. And you'll see what the top looks like. That's Standing Stone. It's an obelisk. And it was pushed down from the top of the hill where there were, probably in the last war, uh, they didn't want to mark their position. You'll see what was there. And they pushed it down the hill. It was 6.2 inches high. The, the base was 13 by 14 inches, and the top was 12 by 9 inches. In other words, someone chiseled out an obelisk. Now remember, the Egyptians would make an obelisk to commemorate a battle or some important event. Someone did the same thing. Gee, I wonder what they were celebrating. Well, I'll, obviously, I'm going to tell you. Here's the base of the thing. You can clearly say it's square. Came from up there. Oh, I should use my pointer. Somebody complained and said I should use the pointer. This is where it came from, and this was some trenches, and I think some soldiers were here during the last war, and they wound up, um, this standing stone was on top of this, this ridge. By the way, this is what this spit of land looks like. There's nothing on there, just sand. This is a close-up of what that obelisk looked like. Seashells, stuff like that in there. It's the, the um, bedrock in that area of you know, highly metamorphosized shells and sand and stuff like that in it. But that's the material they had. So somebody built this thing out of haste. There's me and my son. He is 18 years old here, and now he's 35. And we're sitting on the thing. This shows you I was actually there. And this is me measuring this thing and what it looks like. It's pretty heavy. <clears throat> Clues of the stone obelisk. Now, why do I think the stone obelisk was important? After they do this crossing, and the Egyptians have been drowned, his cavalry, <clears throat> they have a, a poem in there. They sort of sing it. It's really a poem. And remember, this was all written after they left Mount Sinai in that 40 years, supposedly wandering the desert. The depths have covered them. They sink into the bottom as a stone. Exodus 15, 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. What was in Moses' arm? The rod. They shall be as still as a stone. Now, <clears throat> what I think happened is when Moses went off to Baal Zephon to get the gold, they stayed at the uh, Ayu Musa, the wells of Moses, which I'm going to show you right now. Um, this is where Ayu Musa is, the, about, about three miles. It would have taken them less than a full day. Actually, the GPS is like right here. This is a more recent photo, uh, satellite photo of what the area. Somebody built a whole resort there. So go book your thing and try to find it along the beach area. But unless they've used it as part of the foundation or it's in a dump someplace, I don't know. But I'm afraid it may have gone bye-bye. So they didn't know what it was. Nobody did. Anyway, 
<laughs> they came to Elam. This is what they call, what Moses calls Elam, where there are 12 springs of water and three score and, se uh, and 10 palm trees. Um, I think after the crossing, they lost some of their foods uh, in, in the crossing of the Bay of Suez because around here to here, they wound up complaining that they have no food or very little. <clears throat> this is um, a, a satellite photo of the Wells of Moses about 20, 25 years ago. This is a more recent one. This is the longitudinal latitude, the elevation of 26 feet, and you can go there and see it. And it's a little bit of a tourist area for the Egyptians, and they call it Ayu Musa, the Wells of Moses. So the, the Egyptians knew where Moses went. They had no problem with that. <laughs> Exodus 15, 27, and they came to Elam, where the twelve springs of Moab, I just quoted that, in, and they encamped there by the waters in the wilderness of Sur, arrived there October 9th. The wilderness of Sur, you'll, you're going to notice through this presentation that Moses gives actually very good clues of where he's going up and through until the, end, until the uh, Battle of Amalek. And after that, nothing until he rides to the base of the hill because he doesn't want anyone to know where he went. Anyway, uh, here's what it looks like then and now. Oh, by the way, Sur is uh, the wadi south of this, about 15, 20 miles, is called Wadi El Suder. They drop out the, the D. It's the same word. Now, it's probably only because Remember, Moses has a string of letters. He can't add any letters. <laughs> there probably was no dollar or D in that, the word that he made this word, sure. But it's the same place. Again, giving very good description of where he's going. By the way, fictional characters uh, don't do that. Here's, here's the, the area. Uh, plenty of palm trees, well more than 70. And some of the wells are dried up and filled up with sand, some are not. There's one, there's two, three, this one had water, this one I don't think it did. This one did have water, there's my son again, his name is David. And this one well is active, you can see there's well coming out of here. Another well, another well, dried up well. Another dried one. Another dried one. So here's Moses' side trip. Now I think it took him a day to get there, a day he stayed there, and then two extra days to get back. And you'll see why. Now this is all why the congregation was at Elam. Now why was the, why was the obelisk made? And they had enough time to do it. Well here Moses and probably his immediate family took a day to go off to Balzaphon. As you saw in uh, the uh, videos on Joseph, series 9, where he put the gold and the silver in a spent gold mine. The only thing I don't know is how long the original mine was. Was it 40 or 50 feet or 60 feet long? The Egyptians destroyed most of it like I showed you. They didn't want this to ever happen again. So I think if it was like 50 feet, 50 feet long, it may have taken them a whole day to get everything out of there. And on camels and wagons, they may have taken with them. Uh, and then, by the way, see this dotted line? They were following a camel trail to Belzephone. These are the camel trails, these dotted lines. And he says it took three days and he found no water. So there's, there's your two days. Then he went to the wells of Mara. He calls Mara right there. And I did go there. And by the way, it's actually, there's the, the British marking right there for where the well, they think the well is. This is what's left of Balzaphon now. The Egyptians destroyed everything else about it. Uh, to refresh your memory, or for those who haven't seen uh, the video on Joseph, I think it was part, part two or part three I had it. Uh, this is a grain sack of today, and there's grain. And Joseph basically put the gold and silver 
in grain sacks and probably put some grain up on top of it. So it would camouflage it. And they sealed them up and they piled these things into the, to the mine cave. It was a gold mine, a spent gold mine. Here's the well. Here it is, and here's another one. Same area where the GPS said it was. So the well's arm. There's my son again, but the reason why I'm showing the picture is it looked like a somewhat of a road here. And we got sand dunes here. This is what this whole area looks like now, sand dunes in many of the areas. So it, sometimes it actually covered the road and we had to hike in. Now here's the key part about the timing of this thing that the other scholars just totally ignore, and I, I know why, because they can't do it. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came uh, into the wilderness of Sin. The reason why it's Sin is the mountain range by the pass is called Jabril Sin, S-I-N-N. -N. See, it gave very good clues, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So the Exodus was the full moon. NASA says this. This calendar says the 12th. So they left either the 13th or the 14th. The next 15th day would be the new moon, which was the 26th. So in here, between here and here, 15 days, they left. Uh, in October, then they're into October already. This is the route. Here's Elam up here. See? The quadrant is a Waddell Suter. So he didn't have the D, so Sewer, same place. The Wadi is right, right here, by the way. This is where the label is. So they camped here. They did about four and a half to five, sometimes five and a half miles a day is the average. They encamped here on the 15th. That was a Friday. The next day, this is where they had the first Sabbath, right here. <coughs> Numbers 32, and they removed from Elam and encamped by the sea, the Red Sea. And there it is. In fact, the camel trail goes right by the, right by the ocean. So in this area here is where they encamped. And he gives the clues. He said, he'd say, by the See, and this is where the closest approach is to the Red Sea. From here, they went inland. So this is one, uh, the 16th was the Sabbath. They didn't travel then Saturday. There's the 17th and 18th. Now, Jabril Raha, there's a funny story about that, and I'll explain it in the next video. Here, Jabril Sin Bishir. This is the mountain range, and the mountain is called Sin. So when he said in the wilderness of Sin, this is the wilderness of Sin. Now, why are the scholars and those who profess they know where Mount Sinai is couldn't figure this one out? I don't know. Maybe you have a better answer. Okay, here's my joke. Jibril Raha. Now, Moses calls it Rafa Dim. You can see the similarity, but there's a reason why. I, in the book, I explain how I took the word apart, Rafa Dim, and it comes out to heal our misfortune and put it to rest. Okay, so I then asked our, our Egyptian driver, uh, is it, um, what does the word Rafa, Rafa mean in Rafa Dim? And he said, Rafa means relief, a kind of relief. And the closest of the, Egyptian, of the Arabic words, Egyptian words for Rafa Dim is, I'll give you the analogy and try not to laugh too hard, but this is what he said. <laughs> Imagine you have diarrhea and you shit your brains out, and you're totally empty. That's what this means, rafidim in the Arabic. So Moses told a joke here. He was basically saying he was totally through with Egypt. He crapped them out, and they never wanted to go back. Didn't want the Jewish people to go back. That was a joke he was pulling here. So, but you could see now, He's, he, Rafa Dim is Jabril Raha. There's no question about it. This is what it looks like. This is the beginning of the, of the pass as you go up into the mountains. You're going from roughly sea level up to about 1,400 feet elevation. 
over 20, 25 miles. Anyway, uh, this is what it looks like. This is the road that was there. Here's a little further up the road. You can see it's pretty stark. And some trees here, the wadi's over here. Here's the wadi here, further up, further going north. Uh, here's a continuation. I showed this one in the 19th. These red dots are wells, and the British, this map, actually showed the name and the location of wells along this way. There's only two ways to go into the interior of the Sinai. You see the Mitla Pass, which is north of here, or you take this path. This path actually shows up in the Gilgamesh story. Not kidding. This is the route of Gilgamesh, because at the base of that, there are two rocks that look like a man and a woman. The Bedouins told me about it. They saw it. I didn't go to it, but it's there. This is the path that Gilgamesh took to get into the interior of the Sinai. So went through here, arrived at the encampment on the 22nd. Now, no, it's just before Sabbath. They were observing Shabbos. So, go on further. This is where they encamp. Now, Exodus 17.7, And he called the name of the place Messah and Meribeth, because the chiding of the children of Israel. Meshah means trying, and Meribeth means strife. The first one is called Melech. This is where it is, right here. This is from a blow up of that map. The spring starts behind these trees. I should have done a better job of photographing it, but at the time I didn't think it was going to be all that important. It's behind here, and it started here. If you remember, the people were running out of water, and they said they needed water. He took the rod, and he struck and opened up a, a, a layer of earth or rock, and the water came out of it. And you'll see it right now. The other wadi, um, uh, Meribeth, is Ayn Suter. This is a, uh, a wadi there, and you'll see it in a second. It's called Wadi El Suter, and this is the well, uh, or a spring, actually, it's called. This is where the battlefield was, and this is the hill where Moses was on, which I'm going to show you in a second. Oh, by the way, here's the longitude and latitude. You can go see them. No problem. Enjoy it. <clears throat> here's another view of it. Getting a little closer back there. This is what it looked like, and he probably used the rod and opened up one of these areas of something that was blocking the water. Usually water travels along a, a gravel layer. Anyway, then. That's what it looks like in the area when it came out. Above that was just sheer desert, just empty. Here's the spring further down. Here's, that's water. And it started way back here. We parked our cars way up there, by the way, behind these palm trees. Here's the other spring. Oh, no, I think this is further down. Yeah, this is the one further down, same, same spring as, the, as these I, I can't really call it a river. It's more like a spring. And this is looking south. The other one was looking north. See this white stuff here? This is salt crystals. We parked our Jeep in this area. And I got out, and I saw the crystals, and I picked them up. I knew what Melek was. I tasted it. It was salt. So the Hebrew for Melek, it means salt. So when he's having the Battle of Amalek, he's telling you where it was. I don't think anyone ever found this before in history. This is the other well. This is the longitude and latitude, latitude if you want to reach it. It's 50 day, 158 degrees southeast of the earlier one, elevation 1516. It's called Ein Suter. It's called this Wadi El Suter. The wilderness of sewer. Uh, I'm not advertising Corona beer here. Uh, it's just what I brought. And here's the, here's the spring. It's just like a little lake. 
Here's a satellite photo of the first one, the big one. And I think this is the other one here. And I don't think it's that one. That may be an additional one here, one or the other here. The battlefield was down here. I say, I think it's around here. Okay, October 22nd. They arrived there, and that was a Friday. Here's Saturday, the Sabbath. They didn't travel at all, one whole day. The next day was the Battle of Amalek at Raphidim. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Raphidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, this is not the young Joshua that you think of. This is an older guy who was playing general here chose us out of men and go out fight with Amalek tomorrow, because today was Sabbath. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses ha had said to him and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur, Hur went up to the top of the hill. By the way, this battle of Amalek, Exactly on 101.5 of those 12,068 day cycles, counting back from October 16, 2046. I covered that in, what was it? Um, I found the clock cycle, and I think it was, it was um, video series seven. Should watch it. I call it God Cycles. Exactly on that day. Also, look, 43 days. They arrive at the base of Mount Sinai 60 days or 61 days after. They could never have gotten to the big mountain, the base of Mount Sinai, and the, the mountain at, at, um, in Saudi Arabia, totally out of the question. Here's the hill he sat on, up on top of here. It's only about 25 or 30 feet up. That's all this is. Here's a blow up. There's the hill, there. Here's where the battlefield was. And I'll show you what I found on it. This is on, taking, standing on top of that rise or hill. It's actually a rise. And this is the, where the battlefield was. And this whole battlefield was littered with uh, flint arrowheads and spears. And on top of here, I found also arrowheads being made in various stages of completion. Now, some of this stuff comes in the Neolithic period. There can't have possibly been that many. So it's a combination of, yes, the Hebrews did use flint arrowheads and stuff like that, but there was a lot more flint there than they could ever have produced. He is looking north from where the battlefield was. And he was up on top of here. This is, I think this was on top of the hill. And this is worked flint on top of here. Some of them were arrowheads, and down below was real arrowheads, no question about it. <clears throat> but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and as they stood up next to him on both sides, and he sat down, one on one side, one on the other, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. That actually is the rock. That's it. And this, the rocks were removed here, and they made an altar there, and it says they made an altar. You're going to see it in a second. But this was not natural. This was removed and they made a place for him to sit. They stood on both sides of him, and they made an altar over there. There's a, a view of the altar looking down at the battlefield, and you're up on top of the hill. That's it. See, the description he gave was very good. I mean, he did an excellent job all the way through. When you read the book, my volume three, you'll see uh, all the descriptions he gave along the way, including the names of the wells, when you take the names apart, it means strife or hurry up or it's very interesting. Here's another view of that altar that they had made. 
Moses built an altar and called the name of it Adonor Nissi. Uh, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that, uh, that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That's maybe why the Battle of Melech was on 101.5 cycles back. Regarding the other two mountains they say are Mount Sinai, this is the one that's at the southern base of the Sinai Peninsula. And it's 7,370 feet high. Do you think an 80 and 81 year old man is gonna to climb to the top of this thing over a period of, in the morning, like three or four hours. No way. His brother was 83 to 84 years old. No way. This isn't it. Also, it would take more than another 30 days to get, get to here from the Battle of Melek. Who came up with this idea? Again, it's in the book Flavius Josephus, pen name. Real name, Arius Calpurnius Piso. All he says is that it's the tallest mountain there. I'm not kidding. That's all it was. Um, so the, <laughs> they made this. So everybody believed this is the real Mount Sinai. No. This is the one in Saudi Arabia. Now, oh, I have one, one, one more thing I want to add here. The tent of meeting was you're going to find out 201 feet by 100 feet. You can't get something 200, 201 feet by 100 feet and be somewhat level up on top of this hill, this mountain. No way. Same thing goes with this monstrosity, 8,206 feet high. This is the one in Saudi Arabia. Who says this? Pliny the Younger when he's writing one of the books of the New Testament. He says, it's this mountain. It probably took whatever the Arabs said it was and said, okay, they may know. Why not? You can't put um, the tent of meeting uh, uh, 201 feet by 100 feet on top of this. No way. There's no flat area. Okay. Now we get to actually at the Mount Sinai. Now, I think they arrived, self same day would be a day to two days after the full, the full moon. Now, this here says it was the 10th was the full moon. I think they got there the 11th or the 12th. They hadn't had enough time because he built an altar. You can see it in a second. An altar of, here's a reference, October, uh, <laughs> Uh, Exodus 20, 20. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thy oxen, in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come unto thee and bless thee. So you know, it's going to be an earthen altar. Exodus 24, 4, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the mount and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. You're going to see both right now. Uh, later, actually, this is another example that because of the string of letters, he can't change anything, can't anything. This part about Jethro, his father-in-law visiting him, comes much later. But it's chapter 18, chapter 24, and actually it comes, comes immediately after 20. But he's stuck. Moses is stuck having to put a surface story that tells the story, but he can't do it in sequence. So that's the, one of the problems they, that he has, so forgive him. Anyway... Rise at Mount, uh, Mount Sinai, either the 11th or the 12th, one or the other. It might have been this. When they first arrived there, they, he goes into the cave with the 12, leaves of the 12 tribes. And this is where God tells him this. And then he rises up next, er, next day early, which would be Friday, and builds the thing for Saturday uh, Shabbos or Sabbath. So 
His father-in-law gets there and he makes, take, took a burnt offering and sacrifices from God. Had to take it from where you're about to see. This is the first picture I took when I, the first expedition in 97. I walked by it and walked by it maybe 50, 100 feet and I said, wait a minute, that's not natural. <laughs> so I went back and took a picture of this thing and examined it. Didn't do an excavation, nothing like that. I did that in the second expedition. So, this is the second expedition, me supposedly advertising Corona, but I'm not really. Um, There's my friend Vic, uh, and we're screening out, I'm doing a slit trench in one side of it to see what's in it, and see how they made it. I knew what it was by then. Here's the slit trench I did. What I learned is it basically was made from two different types of soil and they put a layer of, of um, rock on top of it. And I, I suspect this earthen soil here was smooth that had rock in it to hold it. Uh, this is how, we, how I do these things is we have squares of two feet and I, I brought this system that I could assemble real quick, photograph the thing. I photographed the entire top of the thing You'll see there's two different types of soil from, this is the soil that's around here. This is the soil they brought in on top of the rock, which is like a pavement for them. I also noticed flat limestone, which was important in discovering Abraham's altar. They used the same technique. Here's a top view of the slit trench, and here's some of the flat stones that they put on top. This is what it turned out to be. Top layer of limestone rock. Uh, it was about two and a half feet high. The core was sun-baked river mud and about four inches of topsoil here. And again, remember, God did not want them to have a step. It had to be a ramp, and here's your ramps, both sides. About 18 feet in diameter is the best I can, I can measure. The next thing it says is uh, the 12 standards. Now, what's a standard? Basically, we think it's a stick or a staff with something up on top. We don't know what. Could be some schmata. We don't know. All we know is I had 12 of them. So what they did is they made a pile of rocks around the base of the of this staff to hold it up. Well, I photographed the number 97. And I walked by and I said, wait a minute, that's not natural. This is where geology comes in. <laughs> and uh, I examined it and stuff like that. And I thought I had 12. So I kind of knew what it was. I didn't tell the Egyptian what I think I just found. This is also the area where I found the bush with the two ram's horns in it, which I explained in series eight on Abraham. So anyway, um, the next, the expedition in 99, I brought, this is Frank, a PhD in sedimentology from Germany. And this is my friend Larry, who is a uh, graduate of uh, Colorado School of Mines, a geologist also. This is my geology professor here, and this is the Egyptian. And uh, I didn't want to influence them. I had a grid for them to lay out. And I wanted them to examine it and see if they came up with 12. Totally independent. I did not influence them at all. Here's Frank and Larry going through the whole thing. And here's the, the wires, the area that, uh, where they're examining. And they found it. Now, they marked these things with a, a magic marker, and they flipped the, the stone over. Here's number one. Here's number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And I can tell that Frank is the one who marked the stones because it's a German one. <laughs> <laughs> also a German 7. So, here's your seven standards. 
at the base, the southern base of the hill, actually fairly close to the well that I showed in series eight on Abraham that Isaac had to redig uh, in the same area. So I guess that part of the story is true, isn't it? Whole explanation of video six, part two. Now this is important. I had to figure out the length of the sacred cubit, which means I had to know a lot of the astronomy. I went through this already in series one, how I found the clock cycle. I'm not going to bore you with it now. Go to series six on Moses' ten code systems, part two, and you'll see how I figured out the length of the sacred cubit. It's 24.136 inches, and the clues are only given in the book Ezekiel, who's written by Baruch, the grandson of Jeremiah. He's the only one who tells us it's the, it's the Egyptian royal cubit of 20.67 inches and a hand breadth. And I finally distilled it down to it was what, what's described in, in Ezekiel here. 500 cubits comes out to 12,068 inches, which is the number again. Or... 24.136 inches. The other part of Ezekiel here is a man dressed holding a measuring reed of six cubits. He's in here's six cubits. Six times 24.136 give you a 144. Divide by the 12 of the 12 tribes gives you 12.068 feet. Give you a clue. He's not really measuring distance. He's measuring time, the number of years between reversals. That's what this guy's measuring with this read. <laughs> okay, now we get to the top of the hill. This is the top of the real Mount Sinai. Fairly level, no problem putting a 201 foot by 100 foot tent of meeting. It was basically a curtain. No problem doing that at all. And if thou make me an altar of stone, uh, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. If thou do, blah, blah, blah. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar. This is what's left of the sacrificial altar. Now let me explain this pile of rocks and dirt. The dirt's different from the surrounding area. See these? These are Bedouin graves. They're up on top of the hill. They took the rocks from this to bury their dead. I understand why. I, I don't blame them. They had no idea what this place was. This is one view. That's me. This is from the first expedition in 97. Here's another view. I think this is the, west, oh, the western side. The other side was, this is the northern side of it. Western side, back here is the sacrificial altar. Um, another view, I don't know if, I think maybe the south side of it. Yeah, I think this was the south side. In 97, I did a little digging. I wanted to see what was in here. I knew it wasn't natural. I wanted to see how they made this thing inside. So I, I dug a little bit here, get an idea. This is the sacrificial altar. This is what it originally looked like. What it is now is about 20 feet in diameter for erosion. Remember, this thing isn't going to be pristine. It's 3,305 years when I found it, okay? It's a pile of rocks, and then the Bedouins took a lot of the rocks away for, for burial. It originally looked like this. Now, why this? And it was round because they made... The next video, I'll go into what they made and how this stuff worked, especially the tabernacle and the, how the Ark of the Covenant worked. You'll actually see my, what I think this thing looked like. Anyway, they made a sacrificial altar, those brass that was like five cubits, which is like 10 feet. It's pretty big. So how do you support the inside of this thing? You throw an animal on it, it'd be a couple of hundred pounds without the damn thing sagging. If this thing is round, no problem. The round thing, you put a square table on top of a round thing, and this thing fits fine. You have a ledge here for they can stand. 
to put the, 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 uh, the carcass on top of it for the barbecue. Anyway, and inside, like I showed in, in video series eight on Abraham, that's where the real Abraham's altar is, and you can see it in a second. There it is. I showed the same thing in video series eight, a longer explanation. <clears throat> There's two big stones here. This better shows it. This is the side I came in on. I uncovered up to about here. I recovered the whole thing so the Egyptians didn't know what I did. Here it is. What I found on top was the same kind of building, flat limestones on top of the altar. That was their bed, their table. Moses covered it with his sacrificial altar to protect this. That's why he did it. And it's logical. His sacrificial altar is right above Abraham's sacrificial altar. <clears throat> okay, so this is the layout. Once you understand the length of the sacred cubit of 24.136 inches, about two feet, a little over two feet. Watch the pattern. 100, this is in the Torah, it says it, by 50 cubits. Where's this? Dead center, 50 cubits. Half of that, 25 cubits. The center of the platform where the ark was, 25 cubits, about 50 feet. The bread stand, the candle stand, outside the tabernacle. Everyone screws that one up. 12 and a half cubits, 12 and a half cubits. Equidistant, this was directly due east, no joke. Either he had a compass or they knew where east was, but this was exactly north and south. You can see it, half, 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 half. <clears throat> Sacrificial altar, the tabernacle, door was on this side, not that side. All the pictures I've seen is on this side, which shows you how stupid they are. If you've got a fire going and you've got a burnt animal, it's going to be a lot of smoke. You're going to have your smoke go inside the tabernacle? No, the smoke you want inside here is the one you create that you know you can control. Amazingly stupid why they put it over there. Anyway, the tabernacle turns out to be 30 feet by 60 feet. Pretty good sized building. I think it was like 20 feet high. Uh, and the whole thing was coated with gold, which gives you an idea how much gold they pulled out of that balls of foam. Quite a bit. They had all that gold to line the whole inside. I think the outside, but who knows. The incense table was here, and this was at an angle. It was at an angle, so the boards would hold, the poles that would hold, and the, the, the incense table was here in front of the, the ramp. Here's the sacrificial altar. Here's the remains of where the, the platform where the ark was. You'll see, this is what the soil looks like, the natural soil here. This is different soil they brought up from the wadi. Here's another view of it. I'll tell you right now, this is looking south. This is where the candle stand, the remains of the candle stand is. This is the ark rolled another. The ramp was on this side. Here's the ramp. This picture I took in 97. Here's the slope, 12 degree slope. Clear as a bell, exactly as Moses describes it. And there's the topsoil they brought all unhewn rock. Now they say, why unhewn rock? Why am I looking at a pile of garbage? You know, a pile of rock. It's because uh, the Romans would have destroyed it, the Christians would have destroyed it, the Muslims would have destroyed it. The list is too long. The dumb and the stupid would destroy it now. So that's why I'm not telling you where the real Mount Sinai is. I'll tell people in the U.S. government where it is and maybe the Israelis, that's it. Here's the ramp, here's another view of it. This is one of the first pictures I took. 
Here's another view, and I can't tell you if I'm looking. I think I'm looking north. Here, it's outlined. This is, that's east. This is how it's laid out. This is the dimensions of it. I had photo, I did a grid on it, and I photographed the entire top of the whole thing. I put it together, 16 feet by 12 feet. The platform, 12 feet by 6 feet. It was half and half. 6 foot ramp, 6 feet wide. This is what it looked like. About 2 and a half feet high, and this is its outline. This is a drawing of what they think the altar was in Shechem in, the, in Israel. They found the remains. I should have had a picture of what it looks like now. But you could see the same pattern. The step here, they had the ramp and up here. This is obviously larger than what they had on Sinai. <coughs> Our altar on the candle stand. Here's the candle stand. Here's the... Uh, platform where the ark was, and here's the ramp. Here's me measuring it. There's my friend Vic holding the end of the thing. There it is there. You're looking roughly east. Tape measure there, 25 feet. That's what 12 and a half sacred cubits is, 25 feet. Exactly, the dead center of where it is. This is the remains of the bread stand. Again, 25 feet. Why it has less rocks? Because the Bedouins took the rocks from this to bury their dead, which is on both sides of this thing, unfortunately. They had no idea what this thing was. But I don't blame them. I just, it's too bad. Everything's too bad. Anyway, this is where the bread stand was. Now, I want to tell you the importance of the bread stand and the candle stand is this. It's like a lock and a key. The Torah is like the lock, the story. The key is the way he describes bread stand, candle stand, sacrificial altar, and the ark. The location of the bread stand and the candle stand are exactly what he says, for the reasons I showed you. That it could be no place else. But again, the other alleged scholars who claim they found the top of Mount Sinai but found none of this stuff, now you know they were lying to you or it looks good on their thesis. You know what I mean? 100 cubits he uses, 24.136. Ignore the decimal point. It's merely, it's the sequence of numbers that's the message. 50 cubits, the 12,068. 25 cubits, 6,034, the number of chapters and verses in the Torah. 12 and a half cubits, 3,017, the other number that's used. What's interesting about this, he's putting this all together before he even pulled the, the two tablets out of the cave. And before he wrote the surface story, that means, how did he know about this measurement? How did he know about the 12,068, which told me, the story he's telling us in Exodus about him talking to God through the rod, it wasn't just about the plagues. He, had, he must have had a running conversation with the operating system. And the operating system told him what to do. That's the only way he could have known this. If you saw how I figured out the clock cycle and the measurement in, in you know, clock cycles in series one and the measurements in series six, how much I had to know what to figure out and put together. He had to have been told this. He can't come up with this. And this is where I found this stuff. So the measurements prove I'm right about the, the, the distance as well as the story and this number. Something for all of us to contemplate. But I, I can't come up with another solution other than what I just told you. Now we get to the Ephraimites. They say, by the way, if you follow where all the tribes were around the hill, the Levites and the Ephraimites are in the same location. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> because there are no Levites. 
There's Aaron Zolter right here. You're going to see in a second. This is where the encampment was. And there's where Moses' first altar was. There was a string of fire pits, which I'll show you along here. And I think the reason they put the fire pits here, when they were building stuff on top of the hill, if it got nighttime or dark, how are they going to find their way back? Well, this may have been lit, but if they lit these, they can find their way back. Here's Aaron's altar. Why did he put it at the edge of this large clearing? It's because there's a, a verse in the Torah that says that from here they were able to see the tabernacle. The tabernacle. It's the only place on that large um, clearing next to the wadi that you can see the top of the hill and where the tabernacle was. That's why he put it here. Here's our grid again, two-foot grid. There's the wadi right here. And there's Larry, uh, or dust master, they got the dust in him. Uh, he's too cautious. And he did the excavation with uh, Richard, my other geologist uh, teacher. And this is what they found in here. Here's the pottery. There's a handle of something, and here it is. This is a part of an ostrich egg, and here's bone fragments we found there, all dating to about that period of time. The last time the Sinai had ostriches was about three, two to 3,000 years ago, when it was still a savanna. There's another view of Aaron's altar. Here's the part of the wadi. The whole thing here is the wadi. And it says in the, Moses tells us there is a stream that runs past out of the Mount Sinai into the wadi. It was next to Aaron's altar. Well, guess what? There's your dried up riverbed or stream bed right there. It gives very good description. Here's the place where the golden calf was, about 50 feet due west of where Aaron's altar was. And here's the edge of the wadi, about four feet away. So when Moses said he took the thing and, I mean, it's, it's basically a wooden carving of, a, of, a, of an ad of, an, of a cow, of Hathor, and then they, he coated it with gold leaf, or gold plates. So he smashed the thing up and threw it in the river, right next to him. So he gave clues to where this stuff was. Here it is. A second, you can see it's much more rectangle, rectangular. There it is. Again, that other soil, different from this soil. They got this stuff from the, from the wadi. There's the golden calf altar. There's Aaron's altar. Here's the encampment. We found other outlines of stuff. It would not surprise me that this was where Abraham settled. Because most people would settle where there's a water source, which is here and not on the other side of the hill. So it may be here. We found this of an outline. I don't know when it was done. Here's another one. I don't know if they put the rock around uh, the, the tent to keep it down. I don't know, but this is it. These are the fire pits are found along the ridge. I'm gonna take that back. No, this was I found, this was on the ridge this was in that clearing area, this, and this was the clearing area. Here's the, the ones we found on the ridge above. It was down below. Aaron's altar's there. This is another fire pit here and here. That's it for this one. The next one, part, part four, is going to have the function of how the tabernacle and the ark actually worked. And you'll, you'll realize what they made and what they pulled out of these in, inside of the cave. What was the two tablets? They actually called tables in the Torah, not tablets. And, and what, what became finally the Torah. What did Aaron do and why did he do it? We're talking golden calf here. Where did the tribes go after they left Mount Sinai and why did all of this even happen? And why all the suffering, the slavery, selling the wife <laughs> twice? Why did all of this happen? Why was this orchestrated by the operating system? 
And I think I know the answer. I only came up with one answer. In the next video, I will answer it, why all of you can put this in, into perspective. And hopefully it makes some sense to everybody. Anyway, Die Hole Foundation is a nonprofit foundation, and we accept donations as tax deductible, because we are a science foundation, 501c3. And you can get us at dieholefoundation.com or send e letters, uh, email at research at Diehole Foundation. You can make a contribution to Die Hole, research at Diehole Foundation also through PayPal. Um, and that's it. I hope, I hope I gave you a good education. You now know that all those who thought they knew where Mount Sinai was and pontificated how great and wonderful they thought they knew, you now know they were all wrong. You also know that Moses was not fictional. Fictional people do not create this stuff or have it created. So you know the Exodus was real. I don't want to disappoint many of my uh, Reformed Jewish friends and the rabbis, but um, the founders of the Reform movement didn't really believe this. Now you know there was an Exodus. Uh, these people were real. Moses told the truth. He lied only to conceal his real lineage and the lineage of his brother because they had to hide what the Ephraimites had done. And I'll go into that in the next video. Hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned a lot.